my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. On this spiritual jubilee that we call Pentecost, when the roar of the mighty rushing wind, when the appearance of the cloven tongues of fire, and when the chorus of many languages sounding as one astounds us, I invite all of us to consider the ending of this miraculous day rather than the beginning. The beginning is what most of us think of when we consider Pentecost. It is a dramatic moment, even chaotic, such that the apostles were accused of being intoxicated with new wine by those in the crowd. But the chief of the apostles, St. Peter, calmed the multitude down. He reminded them that it was only nine o'clock in the morning, and then he proceeded to give one of the greatest sermons ever delivered. How far Peter had come from his denials in the courtyard of the high priest less than two months before. Now, filled with the Spirit of God, the same St. Peter declared with boldness to all the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the day went on as the book of Acts tells us. Successfully, but by any standard, for they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. This was truly a wondrous transformation of the apostles, the apostles who were experiencing in real time the promise of our Lord Jesus Christ, who said to them, Now, when the paraclete comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth that proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness concerning me, and you also will bear witness, because you were with me from the beginning. And so it was, beginning with Apostle Peter, who had thrice denied the Lord. So it was that the witness of the Church was born. The Logos, one of the persons of the Holy Trinity, became incarnate by the Holy Spirit coming upon the Virgin, and by the power of the Most High overshadowing her, so that nine months later God was born in the flesh. And now, by this descent of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples, whose number included the Virgin Mary herself, the Church was born in the flesh, in the flesh of these very disciples. A baby wails and cries when it is born into this world, as its breathing commences. The disciples came forth, breathing the breath of the Spirit, in fulfillment of the very last words spoken by the Lord to them before His ascension ten days earlier, when He said, But you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit is come upon you, and you shall be witness unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. But this was just the beginning of the day of Pentecost. Its ending is what I find just as profound. For as the day finished, the book of Acts records a simple conclusion, which, if you will allow me, I should like to quote in the original first, and then the English translation. The original says, Ήσαν δε προσκαρτερούντες τη διδαχή των Αποστόλων και τη κοινωνία και τη κλάση του άρτου και τες προσευχές. Which means, and they continued steadfastly in the teaching of the apostles and in fellowship and in breaking of the bread and in prayers. Here, my beloved Christians, here is the essence of our church life a life born into the world on Pentecost Sunday, when the body of believers began to breathe as one, 
one with the very breath of God, the Holy Spirit. They continued, they persevered, they sustained these four elements, the foundations of what it means to be united members of the body of Christ. The first element is the teaching of the apostles. This is the inheritance of which we Orthodox Christians are so rightly proud. We maintain unbroken and pure the teaching of the same disciples of the Lord Jesus, the disciples who received this teaching directly from him. It seems a marvel that after so many centuries this teaching is unaltered, but so it is. Through these past two millennia of our faith, the articulation and language may change, but the essential doctrine of the Apostles continues in the life of our Church. It is what we were taught, and it is what we teach. This, my friends, is the gift of the Spirit. Second element. Second element is our fellowship, is our communion with one another. Surely this is as much a hallmark of the Church as is the true doctrine. Christian fellowship is the orthopraxy that manifests our orthodoxy. And it is what the Lord enjoined his followers on the night he delivered himself up for the life of the world, when he said, this is my commandment, love one another as I have loved you. You can have no greater love than this to sacrifice your life for your friends. Everything that characterizes our life in the church, whether liturgical, social, festive, educational, no matter what the experience is, everything is measured against this standard, love. Love one another. Anything done in the church without such love cannot be ascribed to the Holy Spirit. It may be for human vanity, it may be for greed, it may be for lust of power, for ambition, or even for decent enough intentions, but none of these are characteristics of the Holy Spirit. For the fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is joy, is peace, is long-suffering, is gentleness, is goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. And I ask you, what is done with an abundance of such fruit? The answer is that it is shared. It is shared with others. It is enjoyed with others and it nourishes others. This is the basis for our fellowship and our communion with one another. The same fellowship which commenced and endured on the day of Pentecost. The third element. The third element is the breaking of the bread. This wonderful expression means the Divine Liturgy, means the Holy Eucharist, breaking of the bread. And as St. Luke says in the resurrection narrative of the road to Emmaus, the Lord Jesus was made known to them, to the Apostles, in the breaking of the bread. Indeed, this is how we know Christ in our midst, by receiving Holy Communion by receiving his very body and his very blood. This was the tradition inspired on the day of Pentecost, and it is one that we keep to this very day. And finally, the fourth element. Fourth element is prayers. The newborn and newly manifest ecclesia was a church of prayer prayers for the world, prayers for peace, prayers for healing, prayers for forgiveness, prayers for mercy. Thus, we intone at all times and for every occasion 
Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison. Lord have mercy. This, my beloved Christians, was how our foremothers and forefathers in the faith ended that first day of Pentecost. And our church has held fast these four pillars through the past 2,000 years. And these four pillars are, I repeat, the teaching of the apostles, the fellowship, the breaking of the bread, and prayer. May we always find ourselves in this same Spirit, breathing with the Holy Spirit, and so be the Church of God in our world, and manifest the body of Christ for all to believe. Amen.